Now, um, Colonel Robert J. Rook assumed command of the U.S. Army Engineering and Support Center July 26 of 2012. The Huntsville Center executes more than 6,000 contracts valued at $1.6 billion annually in engineering, construction, and technical services in support of strategic national programs such as the design and construction of worldwide chemical weapons, demilitarization facilities, Army and Air Force installation facility repair and renewal construction, national energy savings programs, nationwide environmental and ordnance remediation programs, Army medical facilities design oversight and overseas contingency operations. It's a lot of work and that's a lot of money and we hope that we can get involved in some of that. <laughs> um, his military decorations include the Legion of Merit Bronze Star, uh, Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Army Meritorious Service Medal, Five Oak Leaf Clusters, the Army Commendation Medal, Two Oak Leaf Clusters, Coast Guard Commendation Medal, Department of State Meritorious Honor Award, Army Achievement Medal, National Defense Service, two awards, Iraqi Campaign Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, Korean Defense Service Medal, Army Service Ribbon, Overseas Service Ribbon, three tours, and the Army Superior Unit Award and the Combat Action Badge. Now, as you know, typically I don't necessarily read the entire uh, bios for those who come, but I thought it was appropriate today to do that, not only to let you know the illustrious uh, career and service uh, that the Colonel brings to us, but also to acknowledge that and give us an opportunity uh, to thank him for his service. Let's, let's do that right now. Now, before we um, move forward, uh, we're going to have our student speaker uh, introduce. So. Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Susie Zhao. I'm a faculty member in the Department of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, I'd like to take this honor to introduce our student speaker, Ms. Um, Jasmine Winston. Um, Jasmine is a computer science major senior student. Um, she is also the president of the uh, Society of um, American Military uh, Engineers, NM Chapter. And I'm a, uh, Jasmine is a major advisor. <laughs> I have known Jasmine uh, for a long time since she joined NM. Um, I'm really proud of to see Jasmine has grown into a very elegant young lady and from a little shy girl. <laughs> and also, <laughs> I'm so proud of to see her success in her academia and leadership. And especially, I want to mention something. Uh, Jasmine has done um, an internship. Uh, the internship sponsored by, uh, the internship is called Minority College Relation, uh, Relations Program. Uh, sponsored by Army Sustainable uh, Command and the Joint <coughs> Munition Command. And she, ha she did the internship in 2013. During her 15-week uh, internship, she applied her um, knowledge and uh, uh, skills she learned from the university and developed some code, which has dramatically improved the performance of the Army's um, they called, uh, GMC. Uh, data quality scoreboard for the um, enterprise integration office. This improvement is very significant and remarkable. It reduced 95% of the amount of time required to input data and uh, troubleshooting errors. I'm really proud of this, and we're all really proud of that. Let's welcome Jasmine. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, in, I intern with the Joint Munitions Command with the Enterprise Integration Office whose main responsibility was to assure the data quality uh, for all of the different munitions commands throughout the nation. I think there are about eight different sites. 
the main project I was working on there was the logistics modernization program, which reduced, you know, inventory, improved supply and demand planning, and ultimately was developed to reduce the cost. Uh, actually, the product, the project that I was working on specifically was I worked hand in hand with a company that's actually located here in Huntsville, uh, LOGSA, which is the logistics support activity. It's located on the arsenal. They're, they are basically like the database that, that sends all the data that's being analyzed by all of the different military sites across the U.S. And every month they would send my team that I was working with the data that we needed to basically audit it and make sure that it was, you know, the quality was good. And they sent individual scorecards for each different munition site across the nation. So they sent each, they sent about eight different scorecards for us to analyze. So my main responsibility was to reduce the time because it took all of the users about four hours to analyze each different scorecard and find all the errors and record the data and submit it back to the site. So I had to go in and I was using Visual Basic and I was programming the data quality scorecards and I was going in and putting the code behind it so the users wouldn't have to manually go through thousands and thousands of lines of data and go in and manually move it over to this separate application and mark all the errors by hand. So I developed the code that would automatically search that data that was sent in by logs here in Huntsville. It would automatically search and find the errors and then the user would only have to, you know, basically drag and drop it over to this separate application and click the submit button and all that code was connected to a button and it automatically generated all the code to find all the errors and develop the graphs and charts and calculate the percentages of the errors and the correct data that was there and calculate the actual quality of the data whether and it calculated the previous the previous months data quality as well so it would tell you how the quality has changed over the over a certain period of time so ultimately where it originally took users around 4 hours to to, rec to do this assessment every month, the code that I created really brought it down to at the most about five minutes for them to do all of this. So that resulted in a 95% um, you know, decrease in the work time and the workload that the users had to do. So I really learned a lot during this internship. I learned about you know, inter enterprise resource planning, which is really big. And um, I got to attend a lot of different meetings with the government officials and did a lot of different presentations and I was in a new city and it was pretty cold. I didn't really like that being from Alabama, but I had a really great time and I learned a lot about the government and the army. So, and that's pretty much everything. And thank you. So. Um, first off, I, as I came in, I got a couple minutes to sit down and speak with Dean and Jasmine was in there for, for, for quite a while. And I will tell you, if this is an indicator of the kind of student coming out of this school, I need some of them working for me. And there's just very impressive. The work you did was impressive. What I asked my staff to do, and I left my little clicker over here somewhere. Um, I, what I asked staff to do, and I've got a long, boring presentation about what we do. I said, let's just put down some of the, some of the programs we run and to put some pictures of the type of work we're doing so you can relate to it. So um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Corps of Engineers first and where the Corps of Engineers is doing work and then I'll get a little more into the Huntsville Engineering and Support Center and it, it's the US Army Engineering Support Center it's really a Corps of Engineers uh, organization okay here we are there, there's our, our picture so um, it's a little bit about what what the Corps of Engineers does and Basically, you know, some people would say we're the federal engineer. There's a lot of federal engineering organizations, but the Corps has been providing solutions to, to the nation's challenges in uh, water resources planning, military construction, environmental issues, uh, up, and, up and down, you know, s since really the beginning of the country. Um, and George Washington established the Corps of Engineers before we were actually, you know, de declared a country. So. Um, we've always recognized the need, the need to move forward. Corps of Engineers has done a lot of things. Some of the stories now are the things that we're fixing, 
that we did to move forward in the past and you know we've had impacts on the environment and and we're correcting those things now so you know, every every engineering solution has an impact on, on the environment and there's things we've done in the past that, that, that need to be fixed so we'll talk a little bit about some of that work um, you know, the chief of engineers, my boss, Lieutenant General Bostic, always talks about that, that we are ambassadors. We are, we're, I'll show you a map where the Corps is engaged across the world, and we are impacting people in, in most countries in this nation. And we do that on behalf of the State Department and other folks. You know, everybody wants to think about Afghanistan or Iraq, and we've done a ton of work in those places. But really, I think the most valuable engagements we have as a nation are, are at a low level before there's issues other places. So we're working all over the world. This just, you know, I, I'll, I'll actually show a map that basically tells you the core is located all over, all over the country and really all over the world. Um, these are our major missions. So in, in military programs, you can see the type of work we're doing. Um, large, large construction projects, building the bases, building airfields, building things that exactly what you would expect the, the armed forces to be doing. Um, the contingency operations, that's the things that, that we're doing overseas. And, you know, just like to talk about our, uh, our civilian employees. And my organization is 900 plus uh, folks. I've got about five military and the rest are civilians. And they're, you know, the Department of the Army civilians. And they are the ones who are going over and doing this hard work in, in Afghanistan, building the bases that our soldiers you couldn't do the mission without the work that these, these are the real volunteers to me. You know, soldiers join the army and we go where we're told. But, you know, folks, folks raise their hand in my organization and say, I'll go apply the skills I'm learning right now overseas. So I I've continuously have about 30 civilians deployed around the world, many of them in harm's way. And I, I would never give a presentation without, without saying what a, what a great job they're doing and the fact that they are the, the nation's true volunteers. Um, but they take the same type of skill sets they have here and they apply them and do construction in, in other places that are just more challenging. Um, civil works. This is, I, I have a lot of background in civil works with the Corps of Engineers. I've run the Philadelphia District for the Corps of Engineers, which is you know, a deep water port. I run, I've been in the Pittsburgh district, which is inland, inland navigation with locks and dams. Um, I had the Omaha district as well, which has you know, several of the largest hydropower dams in, in the country. So the Corps the core is doing that work up and down our nation's waterways and making trade possible. You, know, you look at the Mississippi, up into the Ohio, and up into the, uh, the Missouri River, that, that a lot of the nation's wealth flows through those waterways that the Corps is in, in charge of keeping, uh, being responsible for. And, you know, it's a place where our country's not making the right investments necessarily. Um, we need to reinvest in our infrastructure. Some of this stuff is 50, 60 years old. You see the ratings that come out of different engineering organizations every year and talk about where we're, where we're failing to, to, to invest in our future. And just, you guys have maybe heard these stats, but I'm going to read them anyway. Okay, and this is something that, that my boss puts out on STEM challenges. And... In 2008, four of every hundred graduates was an engineer, among the lowest in the world, and only 14 countries do worse than us, including Bangladesh, Cambodia, Cuba, all graduate a lower percentage of engineers. By comparison, in Russia, 10 of every hundred students, or every hundred graduates, is an engineer. In China, 31 of every 100 students is an engineer. So we're losing our edge. The U.S. expects 2.8 million total STEM job openings by 2020 based on the growth rate they expect and the retirements. America needs to increase the number of ste college STEM graduates by a million to, re to, fill that, to fill that backlog or those openings. If not, we're going to have to hire somebody else to do it. So, I mean, just by you being here, just by you being an engineering student, having an interest in engineering, I, I think you have an incredibly bright future. The need is there, you will be employed. I, I really have no doubt. And the nation, I think, needs this. And that's a big, big reason why the Army has jumped into STEM outreach. We, it's not that, you'll necessarily, not that everybody will come work for the Army, but our nation needs this for us to, to, to be vital. About six out of every 100 current ninth graders will go on to earn a STEM degree. Underrepresented groups are, are a great area in STEM uh, for us to, to target. 
Women earn 60 of 100 bachelor's degrees in all fields, but only account for 10 every, out of, out of every 100 STEM degrees. So, you know, we, we need more women engineers. There, there's an opportunity there to fill the roles. African Americans and Latinos account for 25 of 100 bachelor's degrees in all fields, but only five out of every 100 STEM degrees. So, we, we need to reach out to these groups. We need to reach out to children at a younger age. And all of you have an opportunity to do that wherever you are to reach out and help. I, I'm, I'm going to read Dr. Seuss to some students. I know that's not STEM, but you know, we want to get out and I'll talk a little bit about engineering and math to those kids and the importance of it in, in, in the next week. We, do, we reach out to colleges. My, my organization does a lot of outreach to high schools in the area, go and conduct little engineering exercises with them and try to raise kids' awareness of, of this need by the nation and frankly, if you're going to spend your money, your parents' money on an education, you know, what I tell my kids, I would prefer they study something where they can get a job. So, you know, I think that if you, if you look at that picture, I think it steers towards the, uh, some of the opportunities in engineering. Um, we have, a, within the Corps of Engineers, we have a very large set of labs that do research and development on everything from force protection to... Uh, we have a large Cray computer. We have some, some of the most advanced computing labs in, in the country over in, uh, over in uh, Mississippi. Uh, basically, a little bit of everything. Interagency support. We're not just with the Army. I, I'm doing work for just about every agency you can matter, could imagine and also for just about every service. This just shows you the boundaries of the Corps of the Engineers, and it's just a couple of these you know, overview type of maps. Um, just remember, this is a largely civilian organization. Don't be worried, and I apologize for not being dressed up a little more, but I actually had to walk a project site this morning, so I didn't want to get my dress uniform all messy. Um, this just shows our, we have different sets of boundaries for civil works and military. When you look at the civil works, it tells you a little bit about the history of the nation. If you look at them, they're basically, for the most part, broken out by, uh, by the boundaries of watersheds. And, you know, the Corps of Engineers really stood up in, in managing the watersheds of the country. It doesn't match anybody else's boundaries, EPAs or anybody else's, but it really makes sense when you think about running the watersheds. Okay, this is what I talked about, global engagement. These are all the places, I think, in 2012 that the Corps of Engineers was doing work. Obviously, we, we could cover the whole U.S. with, with those little flags, but really working in, in the developing world and uh, trying to meet the the United States goals and you know, where we want some of these, these nations to move. So we do get to engage with a lot of folks and I think do a lot of good. There's a lot of organizations that would like to set up an organization in their country like the Corps of Engineers and, and we try to help with that. Um, Civil Works Mission, I talked a little bit about it. I, we have some, some really exciting stuff. Uh, the, the dams and the hydropower, so there's not a discipline that you could be studying that the Corps of Engineers does not need. And it goes well beyond engineering. When you have a 35,000 person organization, you need HR specialists, you need admin folks. It, there's, there's not a discipline that we don't hire somewhere, but we're really trying to target those engineers. Um, you know, rebuilding the Everglades, you know, based on decisions that were made on how we were going to do land use many, many years ago, we're trying to get things back to a, to a something a little more in balance with what, you know, maybe God and nature intended. Um, up on the Missouri River, we put in this series of dams, and certain species have been, have been impacted, and I spent several of the last years, besides running those dams, trying to build features back into the river that make it a little more natural so we can recover some of those species. Disaster recovery and response, you know, not, I guess a little over a year ago, I got a call and I was asked if I could be in New York by midnight that night, it was mid-afternoon, and Hurricane Sandy had just hit. And, you know, we, we had to go respond. I, I, initially, our biggest, our biggest job was to pump out all the water that was in all the tunnels that stopped people from moving around the city and to help recover the electricity and help recover all, all the different infrastructure that we probably need to upgrade and to, to protect from things like sea rise. So, we're, uh, we are the nation's kind of emergency uh, 911 call. And I, I think we, we make great, 
great strides. You know, there, there were some problems with Katrina, but the nation has relooked the way we do disaster response. And I think uh, the president was, he gave us different direction than we ever had about how we could go out there and help people. And it was kind of taking the gloves off and get out there and make an impact as soon as you can. And we'll worry a little bit about the rules later. So it was, it was really good for us to be able to get in there and do, and do things a little more aggressively and not worry about bureaucracy. And that's what the federal government really thrives on. And that's not a bad thing, but it's when in times of disaster, you want people to be able to hit the ground running. Um, I talked a little bit about our civil works program. Just want you to see where, where the investments in, in civil works are going. And it's not enough. I, we have dams that need to be rebuilt. We have, uh, we have hydropower dams that are operating inefficiently because we're not making the right investments. So a whole, whole lot of issues there. You know, interestingly, you see the uh, Lake Seminole, the Mobile District, looks like a campground. That's what it is. The Corps of Engineers has more, uh, more, na more visits to our natural areas than the National Park Service. We are a huge landowner and a huge recreation provider for the nation as well. Uh, civil works value to the nation. You, you can, this is, the last is the investment, and, you know, this is kind of the, the things we're doing. Um, the flood control damages, you know, it's really important we build these structures. Although I think in, in the nation we also need to be careful about encouraging people to move into floodplains, and I think we, we should do some, some smart floodplain management into the future. Um, you put people right, the one thing, when you move in behind a levee, I can guarantee you at some point the water's going to come over top of the levee. It's, it's, it's a risk reduction. There's never a prevention from flooding. You, you, can't, you can't prevent the, you know, the rain of all time from coming or, or the hurricane. Um, so anyway, it just, just some of the things that, that, that we take credit for. Military program missions. Um, really, a lot of the military is, is much more that civil, engi civil engineers. Um, talk about the Huntsville Center. Everything I talked about there is kind of how most of the Corps of Engineers works. We're different. We are a national center. We're located here in Huntsville. I have about 900 employees, and we do programs of national significance, things that need to be centrally managed for one reason or another. Um, some of them are just the things that other people don't do, and, and we end up doing. The center stood up to support in Huntsville here because we supported rocket and missile defense. And we've gone on to, to many different missions. That kind of says the same thing that I just said, 100% uh, reimbursable. That's different than mo most of the Corps of Engineers. They get money to run the, they get money to run the uh, rivers or money to build things on an installation. We are reimbursable. We go out and find our work. Our customers don't really have to use us. So we're a little bit more like you know, a typical AE firm out there that, that some of you may be a little more familiar with. Um, annual obligations, um, about $1.7 billion each of the last two years. Um, you can see the biggest thing we do there is the installation support, which is services and things that we do on Army, Navy, whoever's installations that, that may need them. So we're supporting soldiers, airmen, Marines, and, their, and, and sailors and their families and making, making their lives better on, their, on the installations. I'll just I'll show you some representation of, of what we do with a few pictures. One of our biggest fields right now is energy. And there is, there is no project we do that engineers alone are involved in, OK? We are set up in, in PDTs. We have teams that come together to build projects. So if, if, if you're, you can't just go back and if, if we've got a lot of great technical people but I hope you're working on your skill sets to be able to communicate with people and work as part of a team to, to bring solutions. We, um, you'll have engineers, you'll have a program manager, you'll have a, you may have an attorney, you may have some computer expertise. You, uh, the team gets built for the project and they build that together. But particularly in the energy areas, we, we need mechanical engineers and we need electrical engineers. Um, they're, they're, especially at senior levels, they are really at a, uh, at a premium in this country right now. So, you know, you just see some work there, some solar walls, some air turbines, some, some uh, solar panels. And we are, for the Army, the solution, there's a lot of goals that the, that the President's administration has set up 
to bring renewable uh, resources online to support Army installations. And we are really leading the Army in, and really DOD in, in a lot of these applications. Uh, and the other thing we're doing, we're bringing third party financing in. You know, we're not getting a lot of money from Congress to build these types of projects. So we're challenging, we'll bring, we'll bring a, several energy companies in and say, this is, we'd like you to look at this installation, give us your ideas how we can be more efficient. They'll come in and they'll come back to us with proposals. And along with those proposals, they will come back with financing to do that work. We'll hire them and then maybe pay them back over the next 20 or 30 years out of the savings we're getting from what they built. So really, really, uh, that's something that nobody else really in the Corps of Engineers is doing that we're kind of leading the way here. So the engineers are doing the technical work, but I have a great set of contracting folks and attorneys that can understand this, this very difficult financing and make sure that the, that the country's entering into a good deal and not something we're going to be paying back for several years that, that isn't meeting its investment. We only pay the people based on the savings we make, so we have to work all that out up front. Ordnance and explosives, I don't know. anybody want to go do that work? Very difficult work, but uh, we, we are doing that. We're, we're still removing minefields on Bagram Air Base. Um, I guess one thing I should be clear on, all of this construction is done by civilian firms. The Corps of Engineers, we do design, we set up the contracts to get it built, but we hire, we, we absolutely depend on contractors to do this work. We don't have a construction arm. So it, we're destroying munitions in other countries so that they can't be used uh, against us or against their own civilians. We are uh, clearing old ranges around the United States and, and, and many other places in the world where militaries have you know, shot tank rounds or shot artillery rounds. And it's, it's our job to go out there and clean them up so that they can then be utilized for other purposes. Facilities reduction. This is probably one of our biggest energy programs. And it's, people don't really understand that. But there are so many buildings across this country and that the DOD owns that Nobody's really using anymore, but there's still utilities going to them. They're still heated so the pipes don't burst. So we're, we're removing facilities to save the government money as well. And that seems like a very simple process, but through the years of running this program, we've reduced the, uh, the distribution of materials that go. We've diverted materials from landfills by about 70%. So we're finding reuse for materials, and we write that into our contracts, and we make sure that that we're not filling the landfills and we're getting the best beneficial reuse out of this, these materials. Facilities repair and renewal, very important this right now because the Army's close, you know, you've, you may have heard, you may not, you know, if you watch the news, the other night there was an announcement that the Army's going to the, our smallest levels since uh, pre-World War II. Um, and I, I tell you, I, I, had a, I had a discussion with the ROTC cadets here the other day, and a lot of them are concerned about that. You know, I'm coming out to a small army. I would tell you that whether you're in the Green Suit Army or you're coming to the Corps of Engineers or some other federal service, if you get on board right now, I think it, it is absolutely the best time ever. It may be a little more difficult to get in, but they won't get smaller than this. I mean, if you go back and look at the cycles, you know, the Department of Defense goes like this. We get bigger, we get smaller. And we are definitely at, 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 in a trough right now. So if you can get involved in a career with, with us right now, there, will, there is no doubt that we will get bigger in the future. You'll be in on the ground floor, and you'll be the people who know the systems. And so I really think it is an opportune time if you can get accepted into the system. These are just a few uh, facilities we built for our Civil Works folks during, uh, during uh, the last few years. So we're not just building Army installations. Environmental work, I did a lot of this up in Omaha. There's a lot of old missile fields, um, and we're not using them anymore, you know, through the different SALT treaties and all. We've, we've closed these things down. And a lot of, not that there was anything really bad going on in these sites, except that people improperly, or we didn't know what we were doing back then, the, the solvents they were using to clean the parts have put TCE plumes into, into our water. And we're doing the cleanup and, and making sure that those things are taken care of. We're cleaning up the source, and then we go out and do pump and treat and different techniques to, uh, to clean up the aquifers. Um, I run a very large program. Uh, all, 
all the chemical weapons in the country, that, you know, when we signed treaties with, with the Russians several years ago to get rid of them, we, are, we have reduced 90% of our chemical weapons stockpile. I think that's good for everybody. Uh, and we're down to the, the last site. We just were commissioning the Pueblo, Colorado site, and then Bluegrass, Kentucky is the last site. And these are, each one of these facilities is probably about a billion dollars worth of construction. In Civil Works, um, I, I talked a little bit about this. When I was the commander of Omaha, we had, we had the biggest floods. It's not a good place to be, be in charge of people. We get very emotional when there's flooding. Um, and very rarely take into consideration the 30 years that they just weren't flooded, but they're, it's an emotional thing for people to be flooded out. Um, we have, I, I talked a little bit, you know, about people moving into the floodplain, you know, and usually the river's out here somewhere, but this is what I would call accreted lands, you know, it's basically sand, and people have decided because it's beautiful down there to build multi-million dollar homes on, on a uh, river bank. And then they're surprised when the river rises up and, and you know, every 50 years and, and gets to, to their like So we're trying to engineer solutions to, to protect these areas. But I think we need to do a lot in our country to prevent people from moving into some of these areas as well. But there's a lot of damage from the floods. And uh, every year there's ice flooding in the upper Midwest. And we, we have a cold water, a cold water uh, laboratory up in uh, New Hampshire. And we come in and help try to break up the ice many different ways and uh, to, to protect. Basically, you'll have a tributary flow out into the Missouri River, all the ice breaks up, and it creates a dam and it backs up the Missouri River, raising it, you know, maybe in a period of hours, 11 feet. So you want to get rid of that ice jam as soon as you can. Just a lot of things you might not think that the Army Corps of Engineers was, was involved in. Once again, these are, you know, if you're probably doing something like this here, if you're in this, uh, Forum, uh, we we do a lot of outreach, and uh, you know, I think there's probably some opportunities to do a little more to get people over to see the work we're doing, and and we do have some many co-op programs as well. Hello, we are the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we want to make sure that experienced engineers are made aware of the wide variety of engineering and construction career opportunities that exist in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps is a worldwide organization with a history that spans over 200 years supporting engineering and construction for the nation's infrastructure, water resources, environmental cleanup and protection, and facilities for military missions here at home and around the globe. Currently, the Corps is managing an unprecedented workload for engineering planning, design, and construction for a combination of national and international public infrastructure and infrastructure supporting our nation's military programs. In response, we're continuing our intensive recruitment of experienced engineers to help be part of the government team accomplishing these challenging programs for our nation. Working for the Corps, I think it's so unique because you see so many different aspects that you wouldn't necessarily see even on private industry. The opportunities are really limitless. Um, you can go as far as you want to go within an organization. And, and, that, and I think the way the agency is set up, it allows you that opportunity to continue to push really as far, literally as far as you want to go. I'm just uh, uh, surrounded by technical experts and really helps, uh, helps develop your own personal expertise. And, you're going to be surrounded by this, the best of the best working here. Interested? The Corps provides experienced engineers like you a diversity of work opportunities, competitive salaries, various stable benefits, and most importantly, a chance to be part of a winning team that is energetically engaged in providing vital engineering and construction services that are helping shape the nation's future. I like working with the public and I like knowing that my job has a direct impact on them. I like that sense of responsibility. Here are some of the exciting challenges for engineers interested in expanding their horizons and opportunities while making a difference to our nation and the world. The Corps is currently engineering and constructing over $72 billion of diverse facilities for our nation's military forces. 
currently $5.5 billion of engineering and construction support are also being provided to construct buildings and infrastructure in Iraq and Afghanistan. The engineering and construction programs help strengthen our nation's security by building and maintaining a facilities portfolio that includes 125 child development centers that accommodate over 19,000 children more than 100 armed forces reserve centers, about 60,000 barrack spaces, about 4,000 family housing units, more than 2,000 acres of paved areas for vehicle maintenance, 13 brigade combat team complexes, and 130 high-tech training ranges at a value of $1.1 billion. In addition, Ongoing renovation and rehabilitation of infrastructure for our military bases provides the opportunity to improve the energy efficiency and sustainability of our large and valuable existing infrastructure. Our engineers are involved in the planning, engineering, design, contracting, and construction management of these facilities. They work in teams that consist of other engineers and team members from both the public and private sectors. Innovation and sustainable solutions are welcome. My first project was working at the Vandenberg Air Force Base on the Space Shuttle Launch Complex. First day that I went to work, uh, came home and my wife asked me, well, what are you working on? And I looked at it and I said, you won't believe what it is. How many people would ever have the opportunity to work on the Space Shuttle Launch Complex? You have the opportunity to go out in the field, see a physical construction of something that had been designed that you have seen to a certain extent uh, design work on it, you see it on the plans, you see the specifications, and then you actually see the product being finished. And then you, uh, I guess you could get the gratification of seeing that product finalized and a customer satisfied with that product. We take projects from cradle to grave. We really get to see the entire lifetime of the project. It's a unique thing. Core personnel are also working diligently to strengthen our nation with programs for cleaning up sites contaminated with hazardous, toxic, or radioactive waste materials. The Corps builds, maintains, and manages a comprehensive collection of public infrastructure that includes 12,000 miles of inland waterway, nearly 1,000 harbors supporting 2.4 billion tons of commerce annually, more than 250 million cubic yards dredged annually, nearly 400 reservoirs, 8,500 miles of levees, 650 dams, about 100 projects protecting nearly 300 miles of shoreline, 75 hydropower projects supplying over 3% of the nation's electric power supply, more than 4,000 public recreation sites at more than 450 projects that support 375 million visitors per year, which generates $15 billion for local economies. More than 150 public water supply projects. This monumental collection of infrastructure creates exciting opportunities for solving tough engineering challenges in the geotechnical arena, hydraulics and hydrology, coastal engineering, structural engineering, cost engineering, project management, construction management, ecosystem sustainability, and environmental restoration, just to name a few. The impressive thing to me is that the Corps reaches to so many different areas. So if you're not an engineer, just because we're the Corps of Engineers doesn't mean that you can't provide something, a meaningful thing to the Corps. We have uh, geotechs, we have park rangers, we have civil works, we have hydrologists, electricians, all those work in those plants. And to me, that makes the core for our organization. We're a whole array of different people coming together. The core is not just a bunch of engineers. There is a lot of professionals from a variety of different fields that have to work together to accomplish the mission. So there is a lot of room to grow. Civilian engineers working in the Corps have the opportunity to work with the 2,500 members of the world-class engineering research and development labs, such as the Corps' Construction Engineering Research Lab at Champaign, Illinois, as well as the Corps' Hydraulics and the Coastal and Hydraulics Geotechnical and Structures, Environmental and Information Technology Laboratories in Vicksburg, Mississippi. The work of the Corps' labs focuses on exotic subjects ranging from coastal shore protection, 
to blast protection to state-of-the-art Arctic engineering issues. This is the perfect opportunity for you to come and actually see some technology applied in real life. The Corus Labs work for a diverse group of customers, executing an annual budget of over $1 billion to support state-of-the-art mapping and topographic analysis, cutting-edge construction engineering, high-tech coastal and hydraulic systems modeling, and complex geotechnical and structural systems analysis to make the nation's infrastructure more reliable. Whether you are a recent graduate with an advanced degree or an experienced professional working in the engineering and construction fields, working for the Corps as a federal employee can provide you with unique challenges to grow your engineering skills, along with exciting career opportunities. You're given the opportunity to really, to really excel in your career development. Speaking of opportunities, the federal government is America's largest employer, hiring more than 300,000 people every year. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has about 34,000 dedicated civilians and soldiers who are pursuing the delivery of high-quality products and solutions to customers each day in more than 90 countries worldwide. Because of its mission and roles, we believe that no other employer can offer you the same variety of career engineering opportunities as the Corps. If you're aspiring to use your engineering knowledge, skills, and experience in public service, the Corps is a highly competitive employer with a bottom line of service to the nation. It's been a wonderful experience. There's been so many opportunities that I, I never imagined I, I would ever experience. As a federal employee, you will have the opportunity to change locations, offices, even jobs, and still retain your benefits and service years. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is an equal opportunity employer. Your success will depend on your qualifications and your performance. As a federal employee, you may take advantage of benefits such as a flexible work schedule, as well as benefits such as life insurance, health insurance, retirement plans, and paid leave. So if you're looking for an opportunity to give back to the nation, uh, to help sustain our quality of life and to the world. In fact, I think the Corps of Engineers is the place for you. We're always striving to grow as engineers, and you will find training and career advancement opportunities for your personal and professional growth. For occupations where there are critical shortages, the Corps may have authority to hire qualified engineers for specific jobs at advanced pay levels. Working for the Corps means working for you serving your community, your fellow citizens, and your nation. Um, I, I will tell you, the, the educational opportunities are, are great. I mean, the, the Army paid for my undergraduate degree and for two graduate degrees. We have, it's funny, right here in Huntsville, we have the, the, US, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, Learning Center, where we do what we call prospect courses, where we bring people back to technically develop them. You will probably do more schooling in a federal career than any industry will send you. Industry will expect you to go do it on your own time and your own, and your own dime. And I, I, I believe that we do a great job of getting folks out to bring them up to speed and, and keep you, really we call it you know, lifelong education. So it's, it's been a, a very, very good thing for me. And I think Kimberly would tell you the same thing. Um, we just put out a $7 billion renewable energy power purchase agreement. It's different because that's not $7 billion that Congress gave us to spend. This is, we have the Energy Initiatives Task Force, and they have studied, you know, done very, very, very extensive studies on where the best places to apply different renewable technologies at different installations across the country. So. You know, they may say, you know, at Fort Humpty Dump, we want to put, you know, a, a five megawatt or a, if they do it, it's a 10 megawatt or a larger project. So a 10 megawatt uh, solar field or wind, wind, you know, turbine facility in this area. And what we will do is then, you know, we'll, we'll work, we'll put out a, uh, an RFP and the people who are qualified in, you know, basically pre-qualifying contractors, they'll be part of that, uh, that may talk pool and we'll put that out and they'll come out 
The Army will provide the land for them to build that project on, and we will guarantee, you know, they have to bring the investment money. There's no federal money put into this. So they will come and say, we can build this facility, it'll cost, you know, $900 million, and our payback period, you know, is 27 years, and we can go up to 30 years of payback. And that took special legislation to get that ability, and it shows the country's trying to attract some, some different ways of financing things. And so it provides that company, you know, a guaranteed purchaser of their, of their uh, power supply for a, for a guaranteed time period for a guaranteed price. It provides us with what, besides the energy and we're locking into a price, we're also getting what I would call energy security. You know, our transmission lines in this country are old. Um, you know, if you're studying electrical engineering, you've, pro you've probably looked at some of this, civil engineers, but we're short, we now have the supply for the energy at that installation. Who, who, who lived in this area the last time the tornadoes came through? You know, Redstone Arsenal shut down for five days. You know, imagine that we had a facility where they were generating their own electricity and some, some of the things could still go on and perhaps even maybe provide some, anything that that installation's not using would be available to the community as well. So there's a, there's a double payoff. So it's really about attracting third, third party financing for, for a large scale uh, renewable power. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that, that the administration has said is important and, and that's why we're going after renewable power. We have goals and, and we meet goals. You know, that's one thing the Army does really good. You give me a goal, I'm kind of held to, held to meeting it. I think that the Corps of Engineers in particular carries the Department of Defense in, in our small business goals. Now, once again, I told you I'm a reimbursable organization and I will meet my goals for small business, but I'm only going to hire qualified people. I mean, that's, you have to deliver on the project because that customer will not come back to me if they don't. And part of our job is to help develop small businesses and to make sure that we're hiring people that are fully qualified to, to do the type of work that, that they're advertising. And frankly, there's, there's a lot of ways small business program helps me. We, we do a great, um, great amount of our uh, obligation right at the end of the year. And sometimes small businesses are easier to get to a contact with because I have different, different tools that, that I can, can go and bring them on board. So we are not, we don't get credit for our subcontracting plan. So if, if I hire a, you know, a large firm to construct something, they have a lot of goals that they have to meet and we watch the contracts and they have to also contract to small businesses. Now a lot of small businesses, they want to contract directly with us and there's areas we can do that. Environmental services, we've really used small businesses quite a bit. Um, I, I think that we'll see with a lot of these emerging technologies for energy and things, I think we'll see a lot of small businesses that, that have the capability to bring those things on board. Sometimes you may come to me, or like the lady asked about the, uh, the, the power purchase agreement may talk, I would encourage small businesses to look at my website, which lists every contract I have. And you know, if, if you have some kind of emerging technology, you may want to go talk to somebody who already has a contract with us and say, I can help you deliver to the Army, and, and that way you get your name associated with something and you get, you get credit, and then when you come in for a contract yourself, you have government experience. Because that's the hard thing. There's a lot of small businesses, and I, I've had very good luck working with small businesses. Um, you know, when I first came in, there, I think there was a lot, of, a lot of pushback at one point that, you know, that wasn't the best approach to go, but I, I don't see that anymore. We, we really do look for opportunities. We hold small business. Uh, General Vi just had one over at Redstone. We're not on Redstone, by the way. Um, and we participated in that small business conference talking about our program and then inviting people to come in and talk to us afterwards. We put on our own small business conference with uh, the Huntsville Center in, in November of every year that we invite people in and we talk about our programs and the contracts, you know, more specifically. This was kind of very generic, but we talk about the contracts we're coming out with the next year. Interesting thing now, when we put out this contract, we have on-ramping periods, so a year or 18 months from the initial award, we'll go back out and do some market research and see if there's a reason to reopen and maybe bring some more businesses that have emerging technologies that we want to bring into that pool. And that's something that really hasn't been done in the past. I, I think it's really kind of neat. I, my biggest challenge area right now is uh, information assurance. We're, we're doing uh, programs as simple as hanging meters on buildings and 
trying to get them to be able to talk through a high-end server to a dot mill network and getting the authority to operate that system where it creates a vulnerability to the network is a huge area. I mean, these programs have started and they've been overtaken with the information assurance and the, and the cyber challenges. So it's a, it's, that is a bold new uh, world and we need help with that. So I mean, we talked a little bit, I know the, the school is looking at, at putting some programs in place that would be able to help us with that and we're, we'll take whatever help we can get. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. We have a couple of uh, <laughs> little appreciation for you, sir. Uh, this is from the college. Thank you very much. And also we have this, have this plaque we want to award you. Well, thank you very much. We'll put these on display. And, and we're, we're proud to be you know, a community member here. And, and I think we can all work towards uh, making the overall community better. But you can make my life easier, and I think I can help you. And as I said, folks like Jasmine that, that we got to meet today, you have some great students here that I think have very healthy futures, and we don't want Boeing to steal her away. Uh-oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> and Jasmine, I have a